Welcome. I'm Peter Goddard, Director of the Institute for Advanced Study. It's really a great pleasure, but no less than fitting, to see so many people here to celebrate the life and work of Clifford Geertz. Too many to mention, obviously, individually, but I'd just like to acknowledge particularly Stephen Lowry, President of Antioch, Cliff's alma mater. Clifford Geertz, Professor Emeritus in the School of Social Science, was a member of the faculty of the Institute from 1970 to 2006. His appointment 37 years ago not only brought his distinguished leadership to the Institute, it also initiated the development of the School of Social Science, which in 1973 formally became the fourth school at the Institute. Cliff was one of the major intellectual figures of the 20th century whose presence at the Institute played a crucial role in its development and in determining its present shape. He remained a vital force, working on the question of ethnic diversity and its implications in the modern world and contributing to the life of the Institute right up to his death. His contributions to social and cultural theory have been influential landmarks not only for anthropologists, but also among geographers, ecologists, political scientists and historians. His deeply reflective and eloquent writings provide profound insights into the nature of culture, the scope of anthropology, and the understanding of the social sciences in general. Social science was part of the conception of the Institute from its founding in 1930, but the initial school of economics and politics established by the founding director, Abraham Flexner, is not the direct lineal ancestor of the School of Social Science that Cliff created. By the time Robert Oppenheimer became director in 1947, the Second World War had taken its toll on the activities of the School of Economics and Politics, and it was merged with the School of Humanistic Studies to form a broader-based School of Historical Studies in 1949. Although the formal birth of the present School of Social Science occurred in 1973, its gestation began in 1966 with the appointment of Karl Kaysen as director of the Institute in succession to Oppenheimer. An essential achievement of Karl's 11 years as director was the creation of the school. We're all particularly delighted that Karl is with us here today. Crucially, Karl persuaded Cliff to become the first professor in what was to become the School of Social Science, and Cliff arrived here in 1970. Fortunately, perhaps, time is too short for me to give a detailed account of the rather painful birth of the school itself. Despite all the difficulties, Cliff persevered, establishing an individual culture for the school and institutionalizing within the Institute its practices. He initiated the Thursday lunch seminars, which continue vigorously to this day. He set themes for each year to focus discussion. He moved quickly to the appointment in 1973 of Albert Hirschman, then professor of political economy at Harvard, widely loved and admired as the second professor, leaving aside Karl Kaysen himself. Amongst the many who have expressed their disappointment at not being able to be with us here today, one whose absence we most regret is Albert Hirschman, who was Cliff's first colleague and who, if he were able to be with us here today, would want to pay tribute not only to Cliff as a colleague and friend, but also to the importance in his own life of Cliff's work in establishing the school. Cliff's vision for the school stressed the interplay of culture and structures as a basis for understanding social change, rather than the more quantitative approach that Flexner had sought to adopt. Under Cliff's leadership, the School of Social Science became a place where scholars could study contentious social problems. In his introduction to the book, Schools of Thought, 25 Years of Interpretive Social Science, which developed out of a conference held at the Institute in 1997 to celebrate the 25th fifth anniversary of the school, Cliff observed, what began as a fragile and imperiled enterprise, suspect, maligned, and ill-defined, became, over the course of a quarter of a century, the eternal, the eternal vigilance that is the price of liberty, for a firmly established, if still controversial, presence both at the Institute and on the social science scene overall. 
even as he established at the Institute a critical place where people could think their own thoughts and resist the heavily institutionalized part of social science, Cliff's own fieldwork and scholarship continued to have broad impact throughout the world. After Cliff's death, his life and influence drew broad tribute from many individuals, including those whose cultures he studied. As Kartini Sharia, chair of the Indonesian Anthropological Association, observed in the Jakarta Post, we mourn the, lift, the loss of Goetz, not merely because he carried out his fieldwork in Indonesia. He reminded us about our precious pluralistic society that might be damaged if we do not take care of it properly. He gave us a tool in the form of thick description, method methodology and holistic ideas about religion and aspects of economy. It now depends on us how we use his ideas and methodology in formulating policies. During his lifetime, Cliff changed the way we think about the world. There can be no doubt that his work will continue to influence and inspire future generations. Now, subsequent speakers will follow without introduction, but I now hand over to James Wolfenson, Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Institute for Advanced Study. It's very difficult uh, when one sees this picture of Cliff smiling down at us and looking elegantly at the group that he's not with us. And indeed, I mourn his passing, but rejoice in what he's left us. Cliff uh, was and is a major force inside uh, this institute, and I have a lot to be grateful uh, to him for. In particular, he'll help me understand uh, the tribal life at the Institute. Uh, he uh, brought to us a sort of anthropological view of the professors, of the tribal conflict, which was evident and become a little less evident in recent years, and was able to help me very much to understand the natives. It was not easy for me, but Cliff was able to stand back from all this and give me insights into the behavior of the different schools, the cockfighting that went on. Uh, fortunately, there was no sati, uh, but uh, the cockfighting was there, and he was able to explain the rules and was able to tell me how it was that this institute functioned. He was a wonderful, calming figure because the problems that we had uh, early in my career here, some 30 years ago, uh, Cliff was able to explain in uh, human terms, and I think was able in so many ways to act as a healing figure inside the Institute at a time of some difficulty uh, that we were having. He was a remarkable figure. Uh, intellectually enormous, uh, but self-deprecating in the way in which he presented himself. Uh, I had the occasion in the last couple of days to read more of Cliff Gertz than perhaps I had read, I must confess to you, uh, before his demise. And I'm sorry, because uh, so much of what I read is invigorating, interesting, and challenging. Indeed, he wrote in his speech to the American Council of Learned Societies where he sought to sum up uh, his work in 1999, that it is a shaking business to stand up in public towards the end of an improvised life and call it learned. I didn't realize when I started out, he said, after an isolate childhood, to see what might be going on elsewhere in the world and that there would be a final exam. A lot of people, he said, don't quite know where they're going. I suppose, he said, I don't even know for certain where I've been. But Cliff's life was full and rich, and he did attempt to put together his perception in three, what I think were remarkable paragraphs, describing his life as an anthropologist. 
He said first, and by the way, this is a distillation of a 700-page book, uh, which he did himself for the same lecture. Anthropology, at least of the sort I profess and practice, involves a seriously divided life. The skills needed in the classroom <clears throat> or at the desk and those needed in the field are quite different. And as we know, Cliff spent 10 years in the field and some 30 years in the classroom and in academic pursuits, never tiring of those field activities, and may I say, drawing rather straightforward pictures of the life he led and the way he carried out his uh, personal needs. The second, he said, the study of other people's cultures involves discovering who they think they are, what they think they're doing, and to what end they think they're doing it. Something a good deal less straightforward than the ordinary canons of notes and queries ethnography. And the third thing, to discover who people think they are, what they think they are doing, and to what end they think they're doing it, it is necessary to gain a working familiarity with the frames of meaning within which they enact their lives. It involves learning how, as being from elsewhere in the world of one's own, to live with them. Cliff, in all his work, understood that he needed to be open to these cultures, to understand them, and to learn from them. He was humble in the face of them, and he brought to us lessons from Indonesia, from Morocco, and other places that he went that are of universal significance. He was a great man at this institute and will long be remembered. Months after his death, I, I still expect him to come down the long West Building hallway, down because his end was up, and knock loudly on my door and come in to tell me that he liked, or more important, didn't like, something I had said or written. His idea of collegiality was the right one, though not, I think, the common one. Colleagues did not conceal or repress disagreement. I think that he thought that argument was the very essence of collegiality, though he was, of course, hostile to essentialism. It was important to get things right, and the first place to worry about that was down the hall. I have, in principle, the same view of collegiality, but I didn't find it so easy to act out. Cliff was one of those special people who make you feel very young. I'm sure that you all have people like that in your lives. Because they know more, or because they've been to so many more places, or because they seem experienced in a way that you will never be, or just because they're smarter. Compared to them, you're a kid, however advanced your actual age. And one of the signs of that relationship is that disagreeing with them makes you feel awkward and anxious. In a book that I wrote in the 1970s about regicide and the trial of kings, I argued with Cliff, disagreeing sharply with something he had said in his essay, his famous essay on ideology as a cultural system. I was really a kid then and, and reckless, and I didn't know Cliff. At that point, we'd never met. He responded in another essay, writing as if I were a grown-up, and I'm sure that that exchange had a part in my appointment at the School of Social Science. When I got here, we did find things to argue about, but I don't think that I was ever again as reckless or sharp as he probably wanted me to be. Sometimes I suppose I was embarrassed to feel like a kid with him. Sometimes, especially as I got older and we got closer, 
it was quite lovely. The kind of social science that he admired, the school that he founded, requires good talk, which means continuous argument, an openness to quirky ideas, unexpected comparisons and flights of fancy, critical exchange among equals. Now we have to sustain without him the conversations that he started, the intensity that he created. In my first years here, our relationship was mediated by the game of baseball, which we both loved. When the postseason began, the playoffs and the World Series, we would sneak out of West Building and go to his house to watch an afternoon game. Never during the regular season. He had a powerful work ethic, and my own is not measly. But some games were really important. And so we would watch and talk about the players and the plays, except when the tension got too great, when we both knew enough to shut up. I once thought of writing an essay about baseball and the intellectuals, but I never did, in part because I knew that Cliff could do it so much better. He would produce a finely observed and intricately worked out account of this strange relationship and its various rituals, and of the love of box scores and statistics by people who don't have another number in their heads. But baseball for Cliff was not like the famous cockfight. Though he was watching the game, not playing it, he wasn't an observer. He was a participant. He was a fan. Whatever distance an anthropologist needs to establish from the culture he's studying, he didn't have it from baseball. Watching a game was never field work. He believed in field work. It was more than a methodology, it was a moral commitment to listen to the others and to watch them and talk to them and live among them. That was the path, the only path, to the kind of knowledge that anthropology was meant to provide. The practice had no doubt deep theoretical significance, but it was also a practical practice, necessary, Cliff thought, to any decent version of global pluralism and coexistence. Getting to know the others, figuring out what they were doing and what they thought they were doing was enormously important to him. He talked about it a lot, even though he didn't talk much, at least not to me, about his own work, his own life in the field. And I have to confess that I can't quite picture him there, though I'm trying, even now, and my favorite fantasy these last months is that one day, not soon, but one day, I will come across in an obscure anthropological journal a thick description of the customs of the natives in the world to come. And I will know by its style who wrote it. My association with Cliff goes back to when we were both students at Antioch College. I remember to this day, the first time I met him, a fidgety, scratchety, given to mumbling sort of guy, in no way prepossessing, although one knew on first exchange that this was no ordinary student. Not that he was given over much to casual conversation, even though in that high academic moment known as the veterans generation, student discussions or better arguments, mostly about politics, were pretty much the order of the day. Cliff tended not to get involved, but if drawn in, invariably delivered some uncommonplace insight, often in the form of a quick retort, um, followed by silence a silence, I might add, that some took as a reproach or embarrassment, as if our commentary fell short in some way. 
I remember in particular one heated and very undergraduate discussion over whether values were objective or relative. Cliff put an end to the conversation by saying that the only way to affirm a value is in terms of another value. It was a kind of oracular pronouncement that could put some people off. We had a number of common bonds. For one, a miserable childhood. I was a high school dropout. He grew up effectively without family. In reality, in a sort of exile, farmed out to a family in Santa Rosa, California, uh, who treated him badly. He discovered how bright he was more or less by chance when he took the Navy V-12 examinations during the war and knocked the top off them. A former high school teacher suggested Antioch. It was an inspired choice, and a good deal of learning was by doing. And we both there married as students. At first, he tended, intended to major in English. He did a stint, I believe, with Hilly, his first wife, as editor of the Antiochian, the student literary journal, and which had the foresight to publish a piece by fellow student Rod Serling. He then shifted to philosophy, coming under the wing of a brilliant, cranky, frustrated, and quite extraordinary philosophy professor, George Geiger, a convincing Deweyite who proctored Cliff intellectually and helped persuade him to go to Harvard and social, in social relations. We and our wives were all four accepted at Harvard for graduate work, although I chose to go to Princeton. Among the looming intellectuals of the day was, of course, Talcott Parsons. At Harvard, Cliff studied with him, although the rigidity of structural functionalism he found off-putting. While Cliff's proclivities were always more or less phenomenological, he was right to say, as Jeffrey Alexander reminded me, we are all parsnips now. <laughs> his, his emphasis on events as social, on, as social texts, on reading those events, treating them as embedded networks decoded by means of thick description, occasionally ran against the social science grain of the times. But what comes out in interpretations of culture and other works, and notably in his two memoirs, Meditations, really, with their marvelous titles, After the Fact, Available Light, is a profoundly aesthetic sense of intellectual design and a career of serendipitous encounters. After we graduated, our paths continued to cross, although my field was primarily political science and his anthropology. We were fascinated by the multiple transitions taking place in the so-called developing world, colonialism to independence, traditional to modernist cultural adaptations, political systems under duress, <clears throat> nationalism and how it affected opportunities for civility and institutional democracy. We tried to make sense of the entangled and entangling networks, webs of meaning and organization that such transitions entailed. Nor were we hothouse academics, but real field workers as well, he in Indonesia and Morocco, I in Africa and elsewhere. Cliff never hesitated at disciplinary boundaries. Indeed, I believe he once entertained the notion of doing an, an anthropological study of the disciplines as savage tribes. Rather, his was an extraordinary capacity to combine the philosophical, the hermeneutical, the empirical, the structural, and the linguistic, converting their theoretical abstruseness into a coherence that reappeared as common sense. His writing was always direct, elegant, and with a style and clarity of thought that made for wide appeal in many scholarly fields, qualities evident from the start. In 1958-9, we had fellowships to the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences. It was an extraordinary year. Among the fellows were W.V. Quine, Tom Kuhn, writing The Structure of so uh, Scientific Revolution, Tom Fowlers, who overlapped with me in Uganda, uh, Roman Jakobsen, we elected him pre king president. Uh, Meyer Fortas, Fred Egan, Raymond Firth, Edward Schills, Morris Janowitz, and many others of similar caliber. Cliff and Tom were on leave from Berkeley, Schills and I from the University of Chicago. 
was at the center that, with the, that we got the idea of establishing an interdisciplinary group at Chicago to study new nations. The intense intellectual atmosphere prevailing at that place providing the perfect venue. We made Schultz the director and Cliff agreed to come from Berkeley, as did Fowler's and Janowitz from Michigan. Our first full year of activity was 1961. It was Cliff who edited our first collective effort, Old Societies and New States. His article in that book, The Integrative Revolution, Primordial Sentiments and Civil Politics in the New States, can only be described as prescient. Virtually all the comparative problems discussed in the committee on law, civil society, identity, development, education, institution, building, corruption, the role of the military, democracy itself, are as relevant today as when, our, when the committee began its work. Nor, despite all the work done since, has our knowledge and understanding of such matters progressed much beyond what we knew in those days. We all had knowledge of cases in depth, combining such knowledge with broad comparative and theoretical interests. It was that combination of members from all the social sciences, science disciplines, as well as law, that gave the committee its special intellectual bite. When I left Chicago for Berkeley, Cliff, Cliff took over from me as executive secretary. The committee continued its, its work for many years until, one might say, the new nation stopped being new. My own relationship lasted with, him, uh, with him lasted exactly 60 years. During those years, Cliff remained the most intellectually stimulating figure that I knew. I was instrumental to his career twice, first in bringing him to Chicago, and second, on being asked to nominate a candidate for the new and first social science post at the Institute for Advanced Study. Then I, I submitted his name. He was, in my judgment, the first among social scientists. Over the years, too, the more he came into his own, the more he developed a marvelous sense of public humor, some of his one-liners becoming memorable. In a phone conversation a few weeks before he died, he said, you know, a lot of people are dying now who never died before. <laughs> Perhaps it was his way of saying goodbye. Cliff was a truly remarkable character. Our contact picks up right at the point that David Apter first left him when he came, arrived at Harvard. And Harvard, at that particular point, was quite something. Um, I'll come to it in a moment and his reactions to it. But the thing that was particularly interesting about it was that from the start, from his arrival, there was some combination of skepticism about generality, which ran into the atmosphere on a collision course on the one hand, skepticism about that, a kind of self-doubt, his wondering, can I make out in a department? I've never had, he was the first to tell me, I've never had an anthropology course in my life when he arrived as a graduate student at Harvard in anthropology. Uh, and on the other hand, there was also, in the way in which he told about things, a kind of faith in the particular. He had a novelist's faith that somehow you would get through if you understood the particular sort of instantiation of things that I loved dearly. Now, I'm going to go back to that, the Harvard, uh, the heady late 1950s, or I should say the heady Harvard 1950s, the scene upon which he landed from Antioch. I think he'd taken a year off before he came. I think exploring the possibility of becoming a novelist, if I remember correctly. Um, there at Harvard in that particular period, there was a remarkable group, a rather wild group, launching so many programs. He said they were launching programs in all directions. Uh, the reigning zeitgeist, you know, there, there, was, there was enough for everybody. And uh, there was a, a funny kind of a mix of things. On the one hand, there was the supreme sort of idealist 
imperialist, if I can use that thing, uh, Tolkett Parsons. So Tolkett Parsons, with whom he worked, was a very special kind of a person because Tolkett Parsons believed somehow that you needn't pay attention to details. As soon as you got the overall pattern, the details would be clear. Uh, and so it, it, led, it led to a kind of joking type of relationship uh, in the situation, but the system was all. Um, and Cliff worked for him, but kept a kind of wonderful distance uh, during all of that in which he could make great jokes about the system, but uh, then uh, say, here's a little bit of something the system forgot about, so that kind of thing, <laughs> like that. And, uh, but it, it was a maintenance somehow, for example, at that period, I remind you, there was the those famous Rayma project that Clyde Cluckhone, his colleague and kind of boss, uh, was running out in, in northwestern uh, New Mexico, uh, that made up of, of Spanish-American, Navajo, Zuni, Mormon, and Anglo, and they were all together, and they were studying their values and the way in which they formed different kinds of persons. And it was forming what was to be, in some kind of sense, the, the hard rock base for the person, so, what we call personality and culture movement. Uh, and um, Cliff, who, if anything, recognized the extraordinary way in which both the skeptic and the faith, the skepticism and faith could live together, I somehow uh, tried to go along with this uh, uh, and always keeping up exceptions, that is to say his, his great contribution even before he got his degree was to issue what I'll call for a moment pregnant exceptions to somebody's system which had the effect of growing uh, and uh, shaping things up. So uh, I, I would say, in, in, uh, <laughs> he says in, that, in a paper that he wrote in 202 in the American Anthropologist that that was the period that shaped him, that is to say, he too developed the faith that if you couldn't state something about the system, then the particulars weren't quite as meaningful as they should be. And yet, you think about instances like, for example, the Javanese cockfight. The particularity of it uh, is so vivid that it helps make the generality uh, in some way. And so that, that backing and forthing was what made him not only a brilliant anthropologist, but also someone who could have been a brilliant novelist and who, in some ways, as, as many people have remarked, uh, he was, in some way, an, wrote with the spirit of a novelist. Now, then there came a curious period later, later on after the Harvard period when we get into the period which was some mix of Java and I want to put it in, in, in a somewhat bitter way, a mix of Java and Sukarno uh, where politics, you mentioned earlier, politics and anthropology collided. Uh, and the recognition of the fact that a third world was emerging and that anthropology was not just something that you did in the wonderful privacy of your study, that, that, that the two of them had to be taken into account together. Um, and he n never gave that up. That his, his, his recognition of that was very deep. And he commented at one particular point that his way of coming to terms with all of this was enormously affected by the explosion, at just this point, this is in the early 70s, of new paradigms. It was a paradigm for everybody. Anthropology, like psychology, like all the various fields, were full of new and blossoming paradigms, plenty to go around for everybody. Uh, uh, there was, uh, he says, I, <laughs> I found one quote, that made me giggle, and when he's talking about this period, he remarks in, in one paper, I contributed to the merriment with interpretive anthropology. That's a real misunderstanding on his part. Interpretive anthropology was not <laughs> one of the, 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 the new things. It was a, a, a deep and revolutionary approach, not, not a school, uh, not one that says you have to look only at the myths and sort of get a continuity of the myths out of Levi Strauss and that kind of thing, but something that had deep methodological and other types of meanings along the way. And uh, I take I, uh, the, the uh, 
I, I think it was wonderful. That, <laughs> I think it was Carl Kaysen who, who was, was head of the Institute when Cliff arrived here, if I'm not mistaken. I, my, my memory may have slipped me on this particular one. But um, uh, Cliff arrived here with his sense of the increasing multiplicity and the increasing multiplicity of anthropologies led him to the notion that interpretivism was such that there was no one anthropology, no one approach to anthropology. It had to be multiple as a human enterprise. Uh, and um, the, the, um, somehow, the, the, as he said, it turned him, it, in a lovely turn of phrase, it turned him into a born fox. So, so that instead of, instead of being sort of, you remember Isaiah Berlin's famous remark to the effect that the, uh, the, the, the fox knows many things and the hedgehog knows one big thing. So he said, uh, I want no part of being a hedgehog. You have to be, to be an anthropologist, you have to be a fox. You have to see things from different perspectives. And I thought that I, I'd like very much to end with one place where his foxness was wonderful. And this takes us out of the relationship with psychology more into law because I'm, I'm also a law professor. And he, on a couple of occasions, very kindly came to teach, uh, to take over a seminar that Tony Amsterdam and I were teaching at the, at the at NYU Law School. And uh, we, got them, we got them to read his things uh, on well, the, the, the cockfight, of course, but also what intrigued them and which was typical of his approach and that caught these students more than any vivid cases they ever read was his description of the difference between Islamic haq law, presumably based on truth values, with dharma law based on a notion of duty, that is to say you accept those things which is your duty to say, and in the Malay Polynesian adat law, uh, which is uh, an appeal to customs. And I remember when he gave this uh, a presentation of this in their reading, one bright gal on the back of the class said, but Professor Geertz, it's characteristic of Anglo-American law that it's all three. <laughs> and uh, he said, yes, that's exactly, that's what culture does. Culture mixes, blends, and then after you think it's all mixed and blended, what it did, does is to lead you to second thoughts and you see the conflict in a new way. He was never still. He'd always see contradiction and conflict. And it was a very exciting thing. Students loved it. Uh, his colleagues loved it too. Uh, he had a wonderful way of making the world seem permanent in its unsettledness and possibilities for further imagination. Thank you. Clifford Gates left us by a sort of a surprise move. This feeling is compounded for me by the very brief and yet normal conversation I had with him just days before I received notice of his passing away. It was the same familiar voice, few words at a time with intervals of silence, few words trimmed, only a little altered this time by exhaustion from which I was hoping he will come back. It is too soon to get used to him not being here. For all of us for whom Cliff was a decisive presence, a colleague, a friend, a teacher, an interlocutor, and for me, a formidable anchorage. So remembrance is difficult as one cannot remember easily a person who is not yet gone. Each time I try, it feels like speaking to him rather than remembering him. 
So how was it, at least for me, to talk to Cliff? It was, at first, not knowing how. Clearly, small talk did not do, do, the, trink, do, do the trick. His absence to it was forbidden, or else it would elicit a tired okay, or worse, a warding off through an exclusive interest in the shared drink. Did big talk help? Even less, it seemed. This used to send me into despair until I discovered that talk was not necessary to pursue, not always, at least. Um, <coughs> uh, uh, until I, I realized also that sometimes Cliff, Cliff seemed intent at not speaking really any of the languages he knew, including English. Um, <laughs> it was always some word, some colloquial word, that was uttered uh, uh, in a way that I didn't always understand or even get. To my reassurance, Cliff, I realized, never mind or never cared for what he called ordinary conversation. His, our conversation was chaotic and difficult, especially at the beginning but he didn't really seem to care, or else what he did. He stirred it, he summarized it, he gave me back with the value what I had just said in few words, and very often in the right word in Moroccan Arabic. One day, <laughs> I was reading with him a 19th century document delivered by a famous king on Moroccan king, on whom he wrote some of his most moving pages. And we were reading and reading, and at the end, it was a document in which, at the end of every century, the Moroccan king would write to his subjects about the good values, the good life, the Muslim Moroccan way, at the end of each century. And it was the letter by King Hassan, Moulay Hassan, that uh, uh, on whom Cliff, a passage that I'm going to quote later. We read and read, and then we fell in silence. And then Cliff came and said, Had you see ya? Had him samha? That was in Arabic. A farewell of a dying man about the values that should survive. That was indeed a farewell. Then we fell into silence. Then suddenly, I had to answer the question, how was it in Morocco the last time we went? We had to go to another register. Then came the, moment, the moments for drink and dinner, and there, not much was said, a few moments of verbal exchange, it seemed to me. It seemed to me that Cliff just wanted to listen if I cared to speak, or else he was silent, listening to what the red the document said to him. I learned with time that he was always listening, listening. And maybe that what gave his whole demeanor the aspect of solitude, of loneliness. Not in communication though, but for me, the possibility of listening to his solitary listening. Then came to this moment when he was received and invited by the people of Sufru the town on which he worked and in which he worked uh, 30 or 40 years earlier, he was received in triumph. He was uh, received as a great man of authority and wisdom. Everybody tried to talk to him to get some glis glimpse of him, but he was always uh, uh, there, very modest, talking with economy and with reticence. The charm of his reticence was something unforgettable. This is the city in which he works three decades before with Hilly, overlapping with others such as Larry Rosen and, and, uh, and, uh, and Dale Ekelman from afar, but also Mohammed Nasiri, Mustafa bin Yakhlef, Jirma Ayyash, Zinnan Zalhouni, and so many others about whom 
he used to care and ask. Few anthropologists can boast such a reception. And, and, and I always asked myself, why was that? How is it? I realized that Cliff has touched the lives of the Moroccans and has touched something important in that form of life. Because beyond the intelligentsia, everybody did ask of him, merchants, politicians, ordinary citizens, and, and other. And so, certainly, his intense interest in the ordinary and the vernacular did a lot of that, for that. But there was something more. There was something more. There was also this kind of powerful presence that, 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 that he had, and uh, this cheerfulness that he always uh, 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 expressed in ordinary gestures and words with such a, an elegant uh, economy. For that, Cliff Geertz had become a person uh, from among the persons Moroccans always asked about. And they did ask about him also after he and Karen uh, uh, spent time in Fez and, and, and again in Sufru, where they both enjoyed the stay and at the same time suffered from the bitter cold of non-heated Moroccan houses. The thing that I think had touched so many people and I'm, I'm, is, 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 is uh, uh, the ethos of communication that Cliff seemed to convey indeed in, in not many words. And uh, 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 this particular ethos of communication played a major role, even though uh, 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 his works were read and before even they were translated, um, they were pursued by uh, uh, a variety of intellectuals uh, in, in that country. That ethos of communication, I want to summarize in this. Uh, 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 the very uh, 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 Cliff simply uh, communicated in a sober, sometimes oracular way, always cast in the most ordinary words and manner. But I mean Geertzian ordinary that no one would forget. Listening to what everyone has to say about the world and guarding himself from being in the way of, what, of that you may bring to it yourself. His, his interlocutor would bring it. That is, in one way, uh, 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 that is soliciting, being ready, being ready to receive your voice. And that readiness to receive your voice was, I think, was on his most distinctive ways. Thus, you could feel uncomfortable, left at a distance, put at hard work to find what those seemingly ordinary words meant for your conduct or your own life, but certainly not othered, as people say today, or uh, not turned into a pure object of study or discourse. The ethos of uh, this communication, of this deep listening, the deep care put into fighting, finding the right word to give you back what you said with its added value was the Gersian form of generosity. This, I submit, is what touched a number of his interlocutors and the many Moroccans that I've been citing. Cliff devoted so much energy at trying to find a new language for anthropology, new or renewed genres. The essay was worked out to emulate the short stories of Nabokov, one author he did care to offer me. I do not think he was envying any writer or any novelist or any writer of short stories. He was working a new literary form from our discipline within the essay, in the play of voices that touched many Moroccan readers. Remembering Cliff Geertz, I remember reading the essay he wrote on this famous kid, king of the 19th century, comparing him with the Queen of England of the 16th and 
with an Indonesian king, Haya Murok, of the 14th century. A Protestant, a 14th century Hindu, and a 19th century Moroccan Muslim. It was to highlight the particular uh, uh, sense of charisma, baraka, that the Moroccan worked with, that Cliff did the comparison, and I read. It was, and, and charisma there, and baraka appeared as energy, as impact, as formidable movement to prove that God has put his will in you. I read. It was an exhausting occupation to be a king with charisma. One only the tireless could pursue what the, charity, what the chastity was to Elizabeth and magnificence to Haya Muruk, energy was to Mulay Ismail or Mulay Hassan, i.e. as long as he could keep moving, chastening an opponent here, advancing an ally there, the king could make believable his claim to be a sovereign, to sovereignty conferred on him by God, but only that long. The traditional shout of the crowds to the passing king, Allah ibarak fa Sidi, God give baraka forever to my master, was more equivocal than it sounds. Forever, says Cliff, uh, ended when mastery did. Reading this passage with Muhammad Nasiri, Zernin, Jinnan, and other, we noted that the first sentences could be Girsis, or the Pasha Zernan, uh, the, the descendants of whom he interviewed, uh, the grandfather of Lahsan Zernan who came to, he, to see him and greet him in Safro in 2000. Or it could be Girs and some elderly or some elderly man or woman recalling events of the time past. The second sentence we understood as the comparative voice of Cliff, within which a leg, the last one, could be either Geertz's or some other Moroccan voices. The co-presence of voices is more dramatic in the third sentence, imperious, uh, riding fast, like on horseback, with brief howls, and ending abruptly in deep silence. Cliff de Geertz devised an art form in which Moroccans could recognize their voices in his and feel the rhythm of their own forms of life in the rhythm of his prose. The openness to others' experiences, to the myriad small and big things of those experiences, the extraordinary work of language to communicate that first order language listened to at the right distance. In many ways, the right distance was key to deep involvement coming close at the right distance, is the lesson I treasure from him. It is his distinctive voice, or at least the one I heard in learning from him and in sharing in moments of his existence. I believe that voice will always speak to us, always at the right distance. I was born in 1926 in San Francisco. Mm. Uh, my parents were divorced when, when I was be, before I was three, mm. and I was sent off to live north of San Francisco in the countryside uh, with an unrelated woman of uh, about 60 or so at the time, I guess she was, a uh, woman I call now. And, I, and it was in, uh, in Marin County. Well, now Marin County now is a very fancy place, but at that time, it was, this was the depth of the Depression. Uh, they were, it was a little place in the hills called Woodacre, of all places, and, and it had two or three hundred people. And I lived a very isolated life. And I went to a two-room schoolhouse, uh, never went anywhere, did much of anything until, until the war came, which was then, that would have been 15 years or so, 16 years on. And then I joined as soon as I could, actually. I graduated my school and I, at the age of 17. And went into the Navy and then ended up in the Pacific. And when I came back, uh, left California more or less permanent. I mean, I've been back and forth, but I left it as, as home. And so there's a kind of cleavage in my life that's rather striking to most people when they hear it. It's striking to me, actually. Uh, 
two teachers, one in, in elementary school, who thought I was a cat's pajamas and really gave me, taught me to learn how to do things, read things and do things and get involved, whom I still remember with great warmth. I have a senior, she's dead now, certainly, by that means. And then later on, even more importantly, a high school teacher, whom I do mention, I think, in something I've written, uh, a man named Lars Tardy, who had been a merchant seaman and was a leftist. This was a time in California, of course, where the left labor unions were, this was the time of Harry Bridges. My grandfather was a labor union printer. I mean, it was all, we were all connected with that kind of thing, indirectly. My father was not, he was a civil servant, but the others were. Anyway, uh, Lars Tardy was, a, was an ex, well, not an ex-radical, he's a radical, but he was I always wanted to write, and I always admired writers from very early. And I certainly all, by the time I got to high school, I wanted to be a writer. And he encouraged that, and I, you know, and I, and I did write some. Um, later on, I had to college literary magazine, so on and so I, I, But anyway, Tardy had a tremendous influence on me. And when I went, as I say, I went to the Navy and uh, headed toward Japan to invade it, but the bomb was dropped. We were just about to get there if he turned around and came back. Um, I uh, went to him and said, you know, what do I do now? I had never thought of going to college because we were poor. I mean, I, not poor, or at least not well off. I was, in those days, everybody didn't go to college. And I, I hadn't thought that I would go. Uh, I expected to work on a telephone company or something, which is what everybody did, or something like that. And he said, well, why don't you, and I had the GI Bill. And he said, well, you've got this, why don't you take it? And, 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 and I said, well, I don't know where to go to college. Um, I didn't really want to go to Berkeley because I didn't want to stay in California. Um, and he said, well, this is sort of, again, left-wing college, uh, experimental college in Ohio called Antioch, where they have this work-study program. They work half-time, you study half-time. And it's a, it's a kind of, it was always a very radical place for uh, ex-radicals teaching there and so on. Not always ex, but anyway, they're, they're there. And I said, okay. And so I applied. Never applied anywhere else. Didn't think of the notion that you could, you know, that you apply and not get in, but I did. And it went on. So he had that, and he sent me there, and he formed my sort of sense of self as a literary figure and as a, as a and politically he did too, as socially. And so, uh, uh, yeah, he was an extraordinary man. Uh, so, Geiger was absolutely shaping in my life. Uh, uh, he's a man who made me into a kind of intellectual rather than estate. I mean, I, I got, he was very, uh, he's sort of known, he's not famous by any means, and he never will be, but he, he was, he was more than just an ordinary philosopher. He, people didn't know of him, and he wrote stuff. Anyway, and it was he who finally, after four years working with him uh, and doing things, who said I should go and be an anthropologist. And that was, again, a very, I didn't know what to do with it. I had majored under, as an undergraduate in philosophy and literature, written papers on uh, Emily Dickinson, on Hawthorne, on George Herbert Mead, on uh, Spinoza, Spinoza, and so on, but not exactly a great current direction of there. I was very much interested, interested then in new criticism and things of that sort. I edited a literary magazine, you know, same old story, I, 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 uh, and I wrote. Um, and I didn't know what to do. Uh, by then I was married to Hilly. I, mean, I met her there and married her there. And she was also, she was an English major, and she didn't know what to do with it either. I mean, neither one of us knew what to do. And I was out of the GI Bill, and Geiger had this um, American Council learns this. I've had a lucky life, as you'll see. I mean, it just everything turns up roses for me somehow. Anyway, he had this very lush grant. I've been talking. Anyway, uh, in each uh, small small co or each college, they gave they took one professor and said, "You give this to anybody you want." So Gardner gave it to me. And I didn't know what to do with it. And he says, well, why don't you try anthropology? And so I had never studied it, read it, or heard about it. Well, I had read Benedict, I think, maybe. I'm not even sure, but I think I did. But I certainly didn't know much about anthropology or have any particular interest in it. And, uh, but the reason he said that was because he had been in contact with Clark Clunkham. Well, how that happened, I don't know. Met him somewhere, I guess. And uh, uh, they were just starting the social relations department at Harvard, Clunkham, Parsons, Talker Parsons. Uh, Sam Stauffer, Harry Murray, Gordon Allport, that, that lot, right? That famous enterprise. Um, and he said, why don't you think about going there? And I said, well, what the hell? <laughs> uh, and, you know, I, so I went out and tried to find out what anthropology was a bit. Uh, and then I'm walking across, 
the Harvard Yard one day and Doug Oliver, a pathologist, teaching at Prebody, comes up to me and says, well, we have this um, group project that's going to Java for two years, three years, whatever it was, and we need somebody to study kinship and somebody to study religion. Would you and your wife be willing to do this? And I said, essentially, there's not the quotation, but I said, yes, where is Indonesia? You know, I mean, <laughs> I had never thought of it, heard of it. Uh, it was extremely well financed. Those were the days when things were well financed. Ford Foundation was financing it. And we had, uh, so I joined the group. There were eight of us. It's, what it is is finding out about how whatever, find out how people are really quite different than you are, what they're all about. I find that it's absolutely intriguing thing to do to figure out what the hell is going on with these people, what the hell is happening here, how this works, how it, uh, and, and the Japanese and, and the Balinese and the Moroccans are to me endlessly intriguing. I mean, it's the kind of, I'm not, you know, I have a reputation of not being a, a very scientifically oriented, and probably, you know, I'm not a hard scientist type, but in that regard, I am. I really am very, I want to know. So I had the same kind of puzzlement that you know that a physicist would have about why some phenomena go about stars or something. I mean, I want to understand them. My main motives are uh, radically cognitive. Um, uh, I wouldn't put it that way because I don't like the idea of cognitive even that way. But but they are to interpret and understand these, and I enjoy that. I enjoy this figuring them out and figuring out how to get along with them and figuring out how to live with them and figuring out what makes them tick. I just find that extraordinary. And, and being allowed to do it without anybody telling me how to do it, and that's the other thing you do have in the field. You're your own person, and you can do what you want. I mean, I, again, I'm a fox, not a hedgehog, so I don't think that there's a single kind of underlying. I've always been opposed. I've always been pluralist. Mm -hmm. I assume people really are different. Mm -hmm. I mean, not radically different, is it? They wouldn't even talk to each other. And this is, I don't want to get the relativist margins, but I think people I do really think Japanese are not just a different version of Americans. I mean, I, I think they're, they're very profoundly themselves, or Moroccans or Balinese. So I'm not looking for common humanity in that sense. Sure, there's common humanity. We're all human beings. But I'm looking for the specific exp particular expressions of it. Again, I start off in literature. I'm interested in specific expressions. I'm interested in, in the, you know, when you study literature, you're not interested, well, at least I, the way I study it, you're not interested in some sort of general notion of what literature is. You're interested in, you know, Dickens and Shakespeare and Emily Dickinson and, in my case, and Hawthorne and people. What, made it, what is specific and special and extraordinary about these people? So I'm more like that. So I'm not looking for some sort of abstract common humanity. I'm not denying people are human, and that's certainly true. But I'm more interested in, in the Javanese, of the, the Javanese of the Javanese and the Moroccanness of the Moroccan and the Americanness of myself. Uh, that's what concerns me, and, and I try to puzzle it out. Uh, I'm interested in what people's ways of being in the world, to use the Heideggerian phrase, which is now, I think it's the right way to put it. I mean, the, I consider myself essentially a writer. I mean, I happen to write about anthropology, but I could write travel books or something else. I mean, I, this is what I do, and I, I am an anthropologist, and I don't think, but the writing is, is to me an autonomous good uh, in itself. Uh, it's not just a deco or decoration. How I write? Well, I, I write very in a way which I don't recommend to anyone else. I write by hand. Uh, that in itself, I suppose, is all right. But I write sentence by sentence. Paragraph usually is the main unit. And, and I, I get it the way I want it, and then I go on to the next one. And, and it takes a long time. But I don't write drafts. Uh, there, are no, there are no integral drafts of anything I've ever done. Uh, you mean it's complete when it's written? Yeah, when I write the last sentence, it's over. Uh -huh. <laughs> Uh, but it's been fuddled with all the way, and as a constant, nowadays with the computer, it's much easier than it used to be. It used to be with typewriter, you had to write things out and write in on pencil and paper. Now you play back and forth. I write something now, I type it on a computer so I can read it because my handwriting is terrible. I then correct it, and then play back and forth, and I, and I build it up to a paragraph, and I build a paragraph up to a section, a section up to a whole. But by and large, anthropologists are always marginal to the societies they're involved in. And yes, I've always been deliberately marginal in life. I, t I don't want to be into something that I can't get out of. Mm -hmm. And so that's true, and that may lead to some of this note in my work too, is I, I feel at the edge of things, and I, I, and I like it at the edge of things. I, like, I think you can see things from the edge that are harder to see from the center. Mm -hmm.